find the people that are smiling and laughing when things are at their absolute worst and grab onto them and hold on because that's infectious and that's uh it's almost like warmth you, you, you get around those people and they just fire you up and they get you past wherever that moment is and the opposite is true right you get around people that aren't that way and they just drag you down Welcome to Mindset Lessons from the Field. I'm Gina Kazaza, the author of the upcoming memoir, Training with the Seal. Today's guest is a retired Navy SEAL combat veteran and CEO. He is a consultant, motivational speaker, the author of nine novels, two business leadership books as well, called Be Nimble, How the Creative Navy SEAL Mind Wins on the Battlefield and in Business, and Be Visionary, strategic leadership in the age of optimization and his newest book be different how navy seals and entrepreneurs bend break and ignore the rules to get results that one is due to release in the spring of 2024 that one sounds really amazing by the way ladies and gentlemen i introduce a marty strong thank you so much for being here i really appreciate it yeah, thanks for inviting me, Gina. Oh, I'm so excited to have you on the show. So I've been doing some research about you, and um, seems like you kind of ended up becoming a Navy SEAL like on a whim. You didn't realize um, it was like there was mixed up paperwork that happened, and uh, someone just said to you, like, you know, um, do you play any sports? Do you swim? Um, they asked you questions on um, if people yelled at you and and all this other stuff. And you were like, yeah. And they were like, you should be a Navy SEAL. And you decided to just uh, I'll go for that. Um, is that. Is that accurate? That's pretty accurate. I mean, I didn't know what I was going for because back when I joined, uh, it was still pretty much a classified organization. There was no movies or books or TV shows. So it sounded kind of like a big sports club. <laughs> <laughs> And I was 18 years old and, uh, you know, brand new in the Navy. And the person that was telling me all this was a, a Navy Master Chief Vietnam veteran. And I was a little intimidated and a little, you know, impressed. And I just kept saying yes. And so and that's how I ended up volunteering. So at the time, you were 125 pounds. Is that correct? hundred Is that 128? Is yeah. that 125 pounds? Okay. And yeah, I was 125 pounds. And um, how was the, so my question for you is you mentioned that you did sports like, and you were a swimmer and everything. Um, you ended up going to butts, 125 pounds. Um, how did you physically um, keep up with, with, uh, with the extensive training and everything? So, you know, buds is more of a, an endurance fitness experience. It's not really about, lifting weights or, you know, moving heavy objects or, or so say like in the, uh, the green beret selection course, a lot of it has to do with what they call rucking, carrying, you know, hundred to 125 pound pack on your back up and down mountains. Cause that's, that's the army's mission. Right. So it, it's none of that. So at 125 pounds, I really wasn't that disadvantaged more so when I became a seal than, than when I was a student. And the, uh, the fact that I'd gone through different disciplines and sports for at least eight or nine years, I surfed for a couple of years when I was a kid in high school in Hawaii. So I wasn't afraid of the environment. I wasn't afraid of the ocean. And all those factors were things that that caused most of the people to, to say, you know, I don't think I can handle this and, and quit. So those factors didn't really affect me that way. And um, I think all those things kind of came together, conspired to make me a, a better candidate than I realized at the time. But when I came back later as an instructor of, of that same first phase and hell week and all that, I could, I understood it more when I watched it objectively and saw what the program was really about. When you were in BUDS, were there any moments either prior to getting in or during it where you were having some doubts or questioning what you were getting yourself into? The first day, pretty much, uh, the first day of real training, I was there for probably five or six weeks. They call it classing up. So as everybody was coming in with you know orders and everything and piling up in a barracks, everybody else seemed to know exactly what they were there for. They were all in fantastic shape. A lot of college athletes. We uh, had a couple of professional athletes. 
uh, lots of martial arts guys. And the more I saw the class piling up, I realized it's it doesn't look like I'm that kind of a person. I didn't look like I matched up physically at all. And I wasn't as enthusiastic because they had all prepared and, and planned for this. And I kind of mm-hmm. fell into it. So my first day when we classed up with 126 people and 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 ran from the barracks to the to the chow hall for the first time, it was, it's a mile there and a mile back. And you do that three times a day, every day. So you're putting in six miles of running bef- aside from any physical fitness or anything just to get food. <laughs> and I, I got to the chow hall and I just thought, I don't know if this, I'm in the wrong place. I don't know if this is the right thing for me. Mostly I was intimidated by everybody else's energy and enthusiasm about doing it as a passion. And then ironically, you know, there was only 13 of us left six months later. So, <laughs> the, the, the vast majority, I mean, all the, I think all, all the martial arts guys are gone. All the professional athletes were gone. Uh, one, or, one or two college athletes made it, but we had 13 originals from that 126 starting class. But, you know, my perspective in the beginning was I'm in the wrong place and I'm not I'm not up to this. So that's what the, that was the biggest. That first day is when I really thought about maybe I should just go in there and say, I, you know, I need to go someplace else. And then the, the second time was on Wednesday of Hell Week. And I had, we started uh, Hell Week with half the class left. We had about 60 people. So already half the class had quit in the first three weeks. So I felt like a, a survivor, but. My other three roommates were much, much better athletes, much, much better. They're, some of them were older and uh, mid-20s. And so they seemed like they were men. And I was still a kid. And so I thought the night the Hill Week was going to start, I thought if anybody's not going to make it in this group, in this room, it's going to be me. And on Wednesday, they sent us up to the rooms to um, get something out of our out of our um, locker. And I, I opened the door and three of the four single beds were vertical up against the wall with all the bedding uh, gone. And the, the floor was absolutely clean, except for the one bed that was horizontal with a muddy, sandy strip going to the locker across from it. And it was my bed. And I realized they're gone because they don't tell you the, if somebody quits or whatever. They just whisk them away in the middle of the night. You never you don't, you don't get to talk to them. We didn't have the Internet, so we couldn't we didn't exchange emails and say, hey, what happened to you six months later? It's just they were gone. So I got scared. And then I realized if, if they're gone, back to the same kind of first day issue, if they didn't make it, if they didn't get through this, how the heck am I going to get through this? It was about a, a minute standing there of that negative thought. And then all of a sudden I got this big rush of kind of uh, I survived and they didn't. And so that was the last time I had any doubts for the, for the rest of the entire six month course. I I thought, OK, you know. If I made it this far and I've and I've beat these guys out so far and I made it halfway through Hell Week, what's going to stop me? It's going to have to be somebody hitting me with a car or something. I'm not going to I'm not going to do it myself. I'm not going to quit. Day one, what made you go back to day two? Momentum. Uh, I you know when uh, when you're an instructor and you watch it from the outside, positive and negative energy is compelling. So if you're around a lot of people that are that are positive. They can pull you psychologically through a lot of bad stuff. Uh, and the reverse is true. If you're around a bunch of negative people. And I had some really positive people in and around me that first day. And, and I, the vast majority of the people there were positive the first couple of days because they're all rah, rah, happy. They weren't tired yet. And I just thought, well, you know, <laughs> am I the only person having doubts on, on day one? So, you know, you get through day one, you wake up the next morning and it's a shock. It's it's a shock because they, they get you up at four in the morning and you're, you're running around doing crazy stuff and you're tired, but you're not tired yet. But about the fifth day of nonstop, you, you're starting to get more tired than you've ever been physically. And that's only the first week. But that's really how I did it. The second day was the momentum of everybody else getting up and just getting up, getting dressed, going out the door, getting in a formation and, and put one foot in front of the other. I just it just kind of compelled me with that, that positive you know, momentum. Uh, the problem is when you get towards the end of the, the first three weeks and hell week's coming up. The class is pretty split into negative people and positive people. Right. And there now are cliques of people that are talking to each other and we'll talk to anybody else to bring them in. This is this isn't what I thought it was going to be. This isn't what I should be doing. This isn't right for me. And so that becomes contagious. And if anybody had any doubts and they're on the fringe of that, they get pulled into that, you know, they get sucked into that. And eventually most of those people go away before Hell Week. And or they, they're the first people to quit the first night of Hell Week. Usually lose about 50, 60 percent of everybody in the first three or four hours of Hell Week. 
how did you avoid the negative people? Because you mentioned you had those those two moments of doubt throughout the training. And like you said, it's like a cancer. Um, So how were you able to just repel it and not get sucked into that? I learned, uh, my parents were divorced. And it was a really rough divorce. My mom had, was a schizophrenic and there's a lot of other issues around that. And I had three or four friends. And at the time it happened, I had two friends who were really funny. No matter what was happening to them, they'd make, they'd make, you know, they'd make a joke about wrecking the car that they just spent two years trying to save up money to buy. Just, and, and so I decided that I was going to use humor as a way to kind of address the world's, you know, stresses and, uh, and so I gravitated towards the people that were like that. I, I sought those people out. And I've told told people that have come to me in later years and said, you know, what advice would you give? I'd say, find the people that are smiling and laughing when things are at their absolute worst and grab onto them and hold on because that's infectious. And that's, uh, it's almost like warmth. You, you, you get around those people and they just fire you up and they get you past whatever that moment is. And the opposite is true, right? You get around people that aren't that way and they just drag you down. So I had a natural um, tendency to gravitate towards the positive, upbeat people, the funny people. Mm-hmm. And and I, I have a pretty good sense of humor. So that that was a good survival skill that I didn't even know I had at the time. Now, you mentioned you run a mile to get seven to eight three times. Um, I remember when I was um, doing the Navy SEAL prep school and um, they ran just everything like to get a drink to and we didn't have to run far to get our water bottle you know to get a drink and i was like oh my god does anyone walk and move at a leisurely pace and i was like no like they don't like even we had to like run anywhere and anytime we had to run everything was a race no matter if it was a warm-up or not and i was just like oh my god my body was not prepared for this um when, how was your body adapting to every, like all of, all of that physicality? So the, the, the channel thing was a two mile round trip. So it's six, six miles a day, Monday through Friday. I mean, on Saturday and Sundays, training wasn't going on. So you could walk over there or whatever you wanted to do. Nobody had um, cars. And for a while, they didn't allow you to drive anywhere. So we'd figure out a way to get, get something usually in town in the Coronado, but Monday through Friday, that's five days times six miles. So you've got 30 miles of road running in boots, in uniform, just just as a base, right? So the first week, that's going to tear you down. If all you did was that and you came in in good shape, it wouldn't probably tear you down. But that same Monday through Friday period, you're doing ocean swims and you're doing obstacle courses and every morning you're doing physical training for about 60 minutes where they're pounding you and making you do all kinds of crazy stuff. And you've got runs. You've got you know, conditioning runs, usually uh, two, at least two conditioning runs. And then a timed run is your third run, which is four miles. So you're going to do probably 12 miles of training running on top of the 30, <laughs> right? So that's 42 miles of running. And at the end of the first week, it's going to feel like you ran 42 miles. And besides every other bone in your body and muscle and everything's aching from all the other stuff that you did. By the end of the second week, because you have to show up in in good physical shape, by the end of the second week, you've kind of, I won't say being, you're not numb to it, but you're not, you're you're mentally numb to it. Mm -hmm. You're fatigued, you're tired, you're dragging yourself out of the bed in the morning. It, It makes it, it's hard to believe that you're actually going to go on a four or five mile sand run as a condition run after you went to the chow hall and back. You know, mm-hmm. in the morning breakfast, but it doesn't stop. It never, it never ends. And it's kind of like the constancy of uh, the uh, what you just described. If you're in a constant state of motion, and that's the way you have to always be, you either adapt or you quit. Mm-hmm. And the punishment of not being in constant motion was worse than being in constant motion. I mean, if you want to do fifty to to one hundred and fifty push-ups because somebody saw you standing there or walking. Um, that's the price you paid. So you might as well just play the game and, you know, keep moving or else you're going to pay the price. So you got smart at that kind of like a prisoner of war thing. You learned the rules of the environment. You adapted, you evolved and you hardened. You you became, by the third week, you were, you were in pretty good shape mentally and physically. And you were, um, it wasn't that they were training you to be stronger, but they were training your endurance mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, most people coming in weren't 
long, you know, long distance runners. They were athletes in sports, they lifting weight. This was a different thing. This was, you know, like a like a an endurance race or something. It's just long, slow, and never stopping. So uh, and that brings you right up to hell week. So by the time you get to hell week, let's say you started at hundred percent strength uh, physically on day one. By the time you get to hell week, you're probably at about 50, 60%. Although you've mentally figured out a way to cope with it. And then hell week hits and that drags you down to about 25% of your physical strength by the end of that week. So what you hope is that this is part of the, the experiment that, that's been going on since 62 and they actually designed this back in World War II and a lot of it was, was recreated and installed in 1962 for SEAL training. You you enter you enter Hell Week with a mindset. It's either a mindset that I don't know if I'm going to do this or not or make this. I've got this is I'm peaking right now on day one of, of Hell Week. Or I think I'm ready for this and I'm, I'm not going to quit. They're going to have to wake me up after I pass up. I'm not going to quit. Physically, you're going to go downhill for the whole week. You're going to get worse and slower and, and you're never going to sleep and all that. But mentally, what happens is you kind of kick into a whole different mode. You start to realize by Tuesday that you can handle it. You can survive without sleep and you're so tired, but you're still doing it. You got other people around you. Hardly anybody ever quits after Wednesday night in hell week. Almost never, because there's a certain, certain thing that happens to you. Uh, when the sun comes up on Wednesday morning, that's the last time you get a lot of people quitting. Um, after that, it's, it's a rare, a rare event. So now you've mentally switched on. They call it going on automatic. You're, you've mentally psychologically going on automatic you put one foot in front of the other of course a lot of stuff you're doing there's safety involved and you're trying to help each other out and you're communicating but you've shifted into a whole different kind of a mindset that you're not going to get beat by this and not only that you're going to help everybody around you not get beat by this and you know they've got your back and they're going to try to help you not get beat by this and so it's no longer about you and individual survival now it's about team and us and how are we going to get to the end and it all kind of galvanizes. And at the end of the week, you look at each other and it's like combat. You all made it through this crucible mm -hmm. and you're the survivors and you've got some commonalities, mostly psychological commonalities. Today's podcast episode is brought to you by my absolute favorite company. If you know me or seen videos or photos of me, then you know I always have one on my wrist. I absolutely adore this company. DiscoverOmnia.com. DiscoverOmnia.com is the world's first smart crystal bracelet. Every single bracelet is handmade in the USA using real genuine crystals made on memory wire. Every bracelet is unisex and they're also aromatherapy. The cool part is the black onyx charm that is on the bracelet. It scans to your cell phone, connecting you to their wellness hub Elevate. You can also access their Wellness Hub Elevate on your computer or tablet. You just have to sign into your account. The bracelet gives you a 12 month membership. It has over 200 pieces of self care content from motivational tips, meditations, breathing exercises, exercises around the theme of your bracelet, printable journals, and so much more. The content is ever growing. Nuts and all. The bracelet also gives you lifetime access to their Elevate Together Club, which meets monthly via Zoom. Each month is themed, giving you actionable takeaways to elevate your life. And with this podcast episode, you get 40% off your purchase order by using the code Mindset Podcast. Use that code Mindset Podcast for 40% off. Just go to discoveromnia.com. DiscoverOmnia.com, code Mindset Podcast for 40% off. Get your bracelet today. What um, was, did you find the most challenging for yourself if there was something that was challenging? It all, it's all in first phase. Um, so they're a little bit smarter about it these days. Actually, they were smarter about it by the time eight years later when I went back to be um, the head of the first phase of training as an instructor. So you've got sand and you've got salt water <clears throat> and then you've got cotton clothes and then you've got friction. So when you put those three things together, it's essentially like wearing pants that have been lined on the inside with, with sandpaper. Mm -hmm. You never get away from it. 
and every part of your body gets chafed and some parts of your body where there's a lot of um a lot of concentration of friction um you just get you get ripped apart i mean you actually get like i had quarter size holes in, in the inside of both of my thighs that you can see down into meat and everything and then when the salt water gets in there the sand gets in there it's almost like you just want to scream because it's so painful and and that was really tough and and because of that you end up doing this weird shuffle thing in hell week because you don't want to have any body part rub against any piece of your your uniform and so you're kind of shuffling like an old man and uh i actually um on thursday we were all you know we were lining up and you could go talk to the to the medic and, and this is a long time ago so they've again they've changed a lot of the rules but there was a line to go see the medic and talk to the medic about your little owies, whatever, a short break. And uh, I got in line. And as I, we were getting closer, I was going to have somebody see if they could do something about these big holes in my legs. And one of the guys who was who like next in line to go in the door, all of a sudden just turned and started shuffling back like an old man. And as he was coming back, he was saying, it's a trick. It's a trick. It's a trick. If you go in there, you're done. You're done. They're going to drop you. If you go in there, you're done. I just heard it. You're done. Don't go in there. It's a trick. And he, and he shuffled past all of us in the line. And then everyone kind of went like, put their heads down. And we all started peeling to the left. And the whole line just turned around. And we all shuffled back out to, to join our class. <laughs> and it was kind of like that old um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang thing. You know, they, they were going to lure you into the candy wagon, <laughs> shut the door, and then never be seen again. So, yeah, that was the hardest thing for me. That that was extremely painful. I could handle the cold. Uh, I could handle the, the stress. I could handle being yelled at. I could handle the, the mind tricks. But, boy, that sandpaper thing was was pretty bad. How long did that – when did you start healing up a bit? Probably by the end of the second – or the, the week after that, um, me and my swim buddy <laughs> – nobody's ever asked me this question in this way, but – me and my swim buddy, there's a Hotel Del Coronado, which is a huge, a huge uh, landmark, 18, 1890s, all wooden, but massive five-star hotel right there near the SEAL teams. And me and my buddy um, actually decided to set up going in there and do a spa thing, like where like massages and sauna, steam room, all that kind of stuff, and even this mud bath thing as a recovery. And we didn't make much money in those days. So the two of us were spending about a third of a month's pay just just to, to have it um, scheduled for us mm -hmm. for the Saturday after Hell Week. Well, we made it through Hell Week, and we sh I mean, it took us a long time to get there. It was only about a mile away, mile and a half, <laughs> but we were shuffling. You swell up after it's all over. Your body goes through all kinds of strange things. You're, you're, it's um, it's the stress of all your, your skin and everything. You just kind of balloon up. And so we shuffled all the way there. And we get on, got in there, and then, and he had all kinds of sores all over him. And that's where we realized that things like saunas and mud baths are not compatible with open wounds. Mm -hmm. But we paid for it. <laughs> so we actually still did it. I mean, we were, <laughs> we, we, we were screaming when we were doing it. But uh, anyway, yeah, <laughs> so about, about the end of the week after Hell Week. So at the end of hell week you mentioned your body just like kind of blows up right um so how long do you get to recover and then when you go back to to training and stuff um what's what's that like for you i mean it's changed over the years slightly traditionally the week after is very little uh physical training uh you, you shuffle walk you don't have to run to the chow hall uh, you have maybe one conditioning run on Thursday or something, but it's a very short run. Uh, there's a lot of water work that week. Um, both when I was a student, when I came back eight years later, the week after Hell Week was things like uh, learning how to tie demolition knots in this 40-foot vertical tower. So it's clean water. It's a heated environment. Um, you were learning hydrographic reconnaissance, so how to go out and look for uh, obstacles along the beach that the enemy would place to stop landing craft and so it's it's kind of that casual kind of it's it's you're, you're filling the day a lot of classroom um anybody that had any kind of medical problems were being seen as the week went on and a lot of people pulled out of the class if they were too bad then you got checked after hell week was over and then if you had anything that needed to be treated then you had to go and get 
treated at a clinic and or you know, sometimes even a hospital, they may or may roll you back at that point. Instead of having you continue with the class, they roll you back, let you uh, recover completely, and they put you back in another class right after they finish Hell Week, kind of restart you at the same point. Gotcha. Um, which is another reason why you end up, even, even guys that finish with you in Hell Week, you still lose class members because they can't make it and go forward because of injuries and or illnesses. Some people get viruses and infections. How did your body recover? I did pretty good. Um, I think the the only lingering problem was the <laughs> the, the the damage that the sand did. Um, everything else, I think I recovered pretty good. I don't have any pictures of that. Mm-hmm. I remember what what we looked like at the end. It, it, there's a thing called elephantitis, and that's where your skin kind of has a uh, a nervous reaction to stress and mm-hmm. fluid rushes out you swell up i mean you look like a like a balloon you can get to the point where it looks like your clothes are going to pop even if you're wearing loose clothes because i saw it as an instructor so i wasn't that bad but some of the other guys looked a lot worse coming right out of hell week and then within two or three days we all seemed normal again okay uh, and i was fine by the end of the week now how did you keep going like what was going on in your mind and how did you combat the pain of what you know the the from the sand and all that to just keep going one foot in front of the other keep doing the drill as the pain physically is really um you know you're feeling it yeah so it wasn't a developed skill at that point um, and I was in a lot, a lot worse situations later on as a SEAL, much colder, bigger waves, more tired, longer, you know, marches, I mean, it's a lot worse. Mm-hmm. At the time you think this is it, like this is the ultimate. And after it, it, the, you always look back as that was the hardest thing you ever did. The other problem is you don't know yet how your brain works. So when you're in the middle of it, it you're kind of in the middle of the experiment. You're the rat that doesn't know why he's in the, in the maze kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Later on, you learn and you learn how to negotiate that maze. So in this case, the maze represents metaphorically how do you cope with your, you know, your mental, your mental dialogue, you know, what's going on in your head. And I actually teach and, and not teach, I, I give paid speeches all the time. One of them is called the voices in your head. And it's about trying not to listen to the voices in your head, but basically be the voice in your head. You run the you run the narrative. So there's a point and and probably just prior to hell week for a lot of guys, for me, it was probably in hell week. You you're in pain, you're tired, you're cold, whatever it is. And you finally just go, it is what it is. I'm not gonna be able to change it. I'm just going to have to deal with it. So, you know, take a deep breath and and focus on executing whatever the next task is. Focus on helping the guy next to you. Focus on not being the burden to the guy next to you. And so psychologically you shift from any kind of victimhood and you focus on being a part of the solution, a part of the team, and and from time to time, even the leader of the of the situation, and and it, what you don't know you're doing is you're basically exercising the whole reason you've survived hell because that you have psychological resiliency in your makeup, the way you were raised, or things that you suffered when you were growing up, and it's a strength that you've not really had tested, therefore you haven't been aware of it. You start to become more and more aware of it through the rest of buds. And by the time you're you're in the SEAL teams and they're teaching you SEAL SEAL team skills, combat skills, et cetera, and you're getting colder and you're getting wetter, and it's you know, but you you realize okay, I know how to deal with this, and the mission is the focus. The guys around you are the focus. Get the mission done. Get everybody there and back in one piece, and and lead when you have to lead, follow when you have to follow, and and then it becomes kind of a mechanism of your personality. Then you don't have to think about it. It's just. It's just your your basic operating system, which for me was probably by the second year I was at SEAL Team too. So you were kind of um, navigating and figuring out your brain chemistry as well as getting through um, what you were going through at the time. Is that correct? Right. right. Yeah. If you're not going to tolerate somebody next to you saying this is this sucks, this is really bad. I, we shouldn't be doing this. I don't think we should be. Why would you, if you won't tolerate that, why would you tolerate that that voice in your own head? So you start to get very um, disdainful of that voice. And if it even starts to creep up in your brain, you're like, stop it. Mm-hmm. It still, 
just I to this day, there are situations I'm in where that voice starts to come back in there again. And I have to think about what's happening and go, wait a minute, because maybe it's a new situation. It's a different kind of stress, whatever. And then I have to just say, okay, stop it. It's not constructive. It's not helpful. I need to be working the problem and, and being, you know, helping with helping other people or leading people to get whatever we have to get through uh, accomplished. When I was um, going through the the prep program, um, I was so miserable. It was so painful. And um, I the way to get me through it or for myself, I just kept telling myself how much fun it was. I'm like, this is so in my mind. I'm like, this is so much fun. And my brain be like, why are you lying to yourself? I'd be having these conversations like, you're not having fun. I'm like, no, I am. It's so fun. And I would smile a lot. I was always smiling. Nobody smiled. I was like, and when we were in the runs and I'd be, I was always last night passing everyone. They were like way in front. I'm still trying to get around the curve. And um, I'd be smiling to them as I was like, you know, like, oh, exhausted, but trying to get through. And I, no one smiled back, but I just remember like, that was the only thing that was helping me to like, just keep going. And at one point it started to become fun. You know, it started, I was just, I ended up tricking myself into just the fact that I stayed through it. And at some point you just forget about the pain. You're just like, uh, you know, you, you can't, you conquer it. Um, which I always, it's, it's fascinating on, on how all that works. What you mentioned. It's all between between your ears. It's all between your ears. (laughs) It's all between your ears. Yeah. It's all you can you mentioned, um, you know, at the time you thought that was like the hardest thing. It was really difficult to go through and the pain and all that. And then you said, but I've done so much, so much worse, right? And colder, bigger waves. What was the worst of the worst for you? Different categories. So you do surf passage in buds. And I was in a winter class. So we had these big California crunchers. You um, also have to come in and land your your rubber boats on rocks, big, these big piles of rocks. And again, we had California crunchers. So guys are getting hurt. Guys are getting thrown out of the boats. And you do it in the daytime. You do it at night. Uh, as an instructor, I watched it. And to me, it was like, like the closest thing to combat because people, guys are coming in with just terror on their faces because <laughs> at, the, at, at the end of your movement towards the rocks, if the wave gets you right, it just flips you like a hamburger right into them and all the bodies come flying out of the, out of the boats and then the waves crash on the rocks and the guys with, you know, broken bones, all kinds of crazy stuff happens. So I thought that was just terrible. Right. And then uh, probably about five years into being a seal, I'm coming in in the night in, on a little coastal area in Greece. And uh, we don't really know how big the waves are because we can't see them. And uh, there's three boats, bigger rubber boats with engines. And we come in there and then we start feeling these swells lifting us up. And then we're going down and the swells are getting bigger. We're going, oh boy, the elevator rides, you know, like 12, 13 feet. And then you're going back down. Yeah. And then we get here the, <clears throat> up in front of us. And uh, we were aiming for a beach that we missed because the, the swells were taking us to the left. And we ended up in about four lines of breakers all three boats flipped we all swam washed survived our way towards the beach and when we got there you know the boats everything's tied into the boats but boats washed up and we were on a um a beach that was probably about 25 or 30 yards wide and about 20 yards deep and then there was a rock cliff in the shape of a shape of a, of a sea, a rock cliff all the way around the beach. There was no way to get off the beach other than back into the ocean, and <laughs> and it was it wasn't terribly cold, it was windy. It was probably you know fifty degrees, but it was a steady hard wind because of the storm that caused the waves. And uh, we're all sitting there shaking like a bunch of little kittens, and there's nothing we can do. Um, we can't really do anything until the sun comes up, and we got to wait until the, the, the waves go down. And we can't climb the cliffs because it was these were really high cliffs. And so within about, I don't know, an hour, we started getting hypothermia and we all started jogging. So we jogged for about nine or 10 hours. We just jogged, all of us going back and forth just to try to stay warm. Telling stories or not talking at all, but you couldn't sit down or, you know. And, um, but those waves and coming into that 
rock cliff magnitudes worse than <laughs> what I had to do in, in buds. Uh, cold wise, um, a three day mission up uh, 300 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, and uh, we uh, got hit by an Arctic whiteout. Lots of snow, hot winds. The snow's coming down, the winds kick up the snow on the ground. It just becomes a big, um, it's like a cotton ball. I mean, basically, you have a cotton ball for any face. You can't see more than two or three feet in front of you. So we hunkered down, and um, it took us about a day and a half, and then we came out of that. So now we've been in the field for a day longer than we thought we were. Uh, the extraction helicopters can't get there because of the storm and stuff. We're up on these mountains. So the the plan is we're going to cross-country ski, which is what we were doing, uh, down out of the mountains. So we have about 120 pounds, 125 pounds per guy. And it took us two and a half days to get down to a road where a truck was going to pick us all up. And then they told us that the trucks couldn't get there because the roads were iced out. So we had to make our way down the road about 25 miles. And so it, the, the long and the short of this is it was everybody ran out of food. We all had hypothermia. We all got frostbite. We were absolutely exhausted. The whole thing lasted about seven days. So two days longer than Hell Week. <laughs> we were carrying 120 pound packs while we were doing it, unlike Hell Week. Um, <laughs> I got dehydrated to the point where I passed out and they had to start an IV on me. Wow. Um, one other guy had the same problem. And we were half Norwegians and half SEALs in the group. When we got to that road, that 25 miles, the officers made a decision to just go ahead and cross country ski down the road, but it was, it was solid ice. And we went down that road at about 55 miles an hour. And every so often you'd hear a, ah! and a complete wipeout sound. And we just kept going and the guys would recover, get back on their skis. And um, that was scary. And we were really, really tired. So that was 10 times worse than being cold in hell week. Um, and then you <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean. I mean, a real mission, nobody plans missions like that. Nobody plans, well, if you're in a training cell and you're trying to prove a point to people that things can go wrong, they'll add a day maybe, and it gets a little bit harder than you thought it was going to be. But the uh, the reality is Mother Nature is out there waiting for you and, and waiting for your ego to to come out and play. And, uh, and, and Mother Nature is going to win that fight every single time. <laughs> So I, I can give you 20 other stories like that. And anybody that's ever been in special operations has been in those situations. You know, it's 10 times colder than you thought it was going to be, or it's not that cold, but you're out there 10 times longer than you should have been. So you still have hypothermia. <laughs> yeah. How long did you go without food? Was it the whole seven days or was it? Um... Uh, we ran out of food around day, well, day three, we realized we we're going to run out of food. So we started rationing it. I think we were out of food day six. So we had no food day seven. But we, I mean, I'm talking about we were eating like a handful of something. Um, wow. And the food is part of the problem. The food was dehydrated and you were supposed to heat it up. He takes snow, put it in a in a cup, put it on top of a, a, a fuel stove, melt it, put the dehydrated food in, mix it up. But if you can't do all that or you're running out of fuel, which is another problem, then you try to eat the dehydrated food with not enough water in there. It dehydrates. It sucks all the moisture out of your body. You get dehydrated. And that's what happened to me and happened to a couple other guys. So there's a lot of other ramifications of, of things going sideways. How do you push through that that fear? Like, of, of you know, that's terrifying. Like skiing down ice at 55 miles an hour you're hypothermic, like, you know, food, like all of that is like, for me, like I, um, I, I'm terrified of the water. And, um, you know, when you're in training, well, for us, we had to go into the swell and we had to go into the water and, you know, um, coach Mac was like the first time I, I said, you know, to tell everyone to go into the water. He's like, I saw the lights go out in your eyes. Like, he's like, I was like, I think she's terrified of the water. And obviously when I ended up being in the water, it was obviously confirmed. Right. Um, but um, it just kind of like, you know, everyone else is doing it. You just kind of don't, you kind of shut that mind and you just kind of like get, get through it, through the fear. How does it work for, for you to, to get through that fear of, of, everything they're going through. Was there ever a moment where you were like, I don't know if we're going to make it? 
Well, it's any, it's like any other habit or any other behavior that's practiced. So I mentioned earlier, you're not really aware of it when you're going through the selection process. You're kind of aware by the end of the selection process that you're you're thinking differently than you, you did, and maybe you think differently than other people do about hardships and things like that. They start training you and they start teaching you about the stress of combat operations, the stress of environmental, um, I'll call it uh, uh, transportation, you know, swimming under under the water with a rebreather, locking out of submarines, skydiving in, at night from, from 13, 14,000 feet, you know, being on a mountaintop, being in, in a jungle swamp, you know, these are all weird places to be. And they put you in there and there are different stressors or new stressors. And what happens, you just keep reinforcing that core psychological resilience and, and emotional maturity that was uncovered while you're going through selection. They know if they can find a person like that, they can teach them all kinds of technical skills. They can't find, they can teach anybody technical skills, but if they don't have that mindset, they don't have that that kind of core way of looking at the world, um, they're not going to finish. They're not going to end up doing these missions, no matter how technically they're trained. So they start with that. They don't try to make you into a SEAL. They try to reveal the, the SEALness about you through the process. Then they just start training you uh, technically and then environmentally. And the vi environmental part is what keeps stressing your limits. So it's it's not, you don't go from being cold for an hour to being cold for seven days. It, it, it kind of builds on itself. Mm -hmm. And you eventually get to a point where you're not sure what your limits are, if you have any, but it's the same thing. It is what it is. I got a job to do. People are relying on me. And if I'm following, I, I want to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing in support of the team. If I'm a leader, I want to make sure I'm leading and doing what I'm supposed to be doing in support of the team. And that's what you fixate on, not not your your uh, physical uh, frailty of the moment. What are some of the tactical stuff that, that are taught? Like once you have that, you're the person that has that mindset that, you know, and then you said they teach technical, like what are some stuff that, that are taught? The Navy is different than, say, Marine uh, MARSOC Spec Ops guys and Rangers and Green Berets and a lot of like SAS and SBS in uh, Britain. Most of those other groups start with infantry. They start with somebody who's already trained how to carry a rifle. They, they've gone through boot camp as infantry. They've gone through basic infantry school. Most of them have gone through advanced infantry school. They know how to shoot. They know how to patrol. They know a lot of things. They know how to use radios. Um, they know how to take... Uh, direction under fire so that's their starting point these guys show up at the say the sfq course for the green berets and they've already got that seals start with basically civilians and if there's anybody coming from the fleet there's somebody who was on a destroyer as a sonar guy so you have to start from scratch so that's why the first part is all about the psychology to make sure you're you're working with the right because i guess the right stuff mm -hmm. And the other two phases teach you uh, one how to how to dive, so scuba diving, first with with open circuit air tanks, and then eventually with more advanced rigs that are um, recirculating what you're exhaling, and and there's no bubbles, so they're more tactical. You're learning all about diving tables and, and all that. You're also learning basic tactics about how to attack ships, so using those those diving rigs to go do the mission or to take you into the to the target area, and then you secure the the diving rig to to appear or something else and then go ashore to do something else and they come back and use it as your as your vehicle to get away um and you learn the basic level of that and then you go into the phase where you're learning about patrolling basically all the infantry skills patrolling map and compass work um how to shoot probably about five different weapons in the basic course um demolitions so you learn about blasting caps and electrical firing devices and all kinds of TNT and all these different kinds of explosive materials. And then how do you actually use them and all the formulas and all that. And then you graduate, right? And then the next phase, which is about four months long, takes you to the intermediate level. So now you're doing much, much more advanced diving. You're doing diving in harbors. You're, you're doing complicated um, navigation courses using uh, navigation boards that you're that you have in your hands and you got time and distance that you're calculating um you're planning missions on the on the ground you're you're learning about um you're jumping on airplanes you're learning how to fly in formation um under canopy and, and land as a team 
and, and then go do your job. You're sliding out of ropes out of helicopters and doing the same thing. So you, these are all other things. You're probably picking up another 12 to 15 weapons that you have to learn. And you become a whole different level of proficiency where you had to be close to, if not expert with those first five weapons in the basic course at BUDS. But once you get into the intermediate phase, you have to be expert at 20 weapons mm-hmm. and, and not sort of kind of, you have to be an expert at how to how to use them, fire them, what their applications are, when that particular tool is the right tool to pick out of the toolbox for that particular mission, whatever. Um, so that four months is is really a ramp, but it's building on the basics of diving and the basics of land warfare, infantry type skills and weapons. Demolitions gets a little bit more advanced, not that much more advanced. And then you show up at your SEAL team. And in that SEAL team, you are assigned to a unit and in that unit they have a schedule of what they're going to do and when they're going to go overseas or be on a ready status and so they have 26 weeks 23 weeks of constant training every single week they're doing something and they'll be going to destination destination so depending on the team if you're focused on desert or if you're focused on jungle or you're focused on say northern europe and all that you're going to go and you're going to train in 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 um, canada or you're going to train in labrador or you're going to end up going to norway or you're going to go down to Central America and you're going to go to um, South America and you're going to train down in those environments or you're going to go to the desert. So now you're doing all the same skills you learned in the intermediate, but now you're really in the environments, the actual environments that your particular SEAL team is focused on. And you're maintaining whatever proficiency you had coming out of the intermediate course and you're trying to build skills, but now you have to learn administrative areas. So kind of like the Green Berets, you have to learn how do you run a diving operation? So you become a dive supervisor or you become a support guy that fills fills the tanks or drives the boats or you're a jump master or you're the guy that's that's organizing and and telling the helicopter where to put the, the rope down so everybody can slide down safely. So you start picking up all these other side jobs that are administrative, but they're how you get it all done as a group. And then you end up being in that final status. You're either deployed someplace and you're practicing the whole six months you're deployed or you're on a ready status and you're maintaining your peak. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the whole cycle from day one of buzz all the way through. And you haven't necessarily been shot at, but you've seen a lot of stress. You've gone through a lot of physical and mental stress. You've had a huge amount of mentoring and coaching going on from people around you that have had, you know, upwards of 15 years doing this thing. And they are trying to make you the best you can be because the saying when I first got in holds true today is the old guys used to say that we'll, we'll train you. But if you've got free time, you better keep training with wherever you think you're weak in. Because when that phone rings, we all go with what we got and who we have. So as good as you are and the people around you, as good as they are, is what you end up going to war with when the phone rings. So. You think about that for a second and you go, okay, I need to get a little bit sharper. I mean, I, I bought a pistol and practiced pistol shooting on my own because I really stunk at shooting pistols. I mean, all of us were doing that. All of us are trying to do extra stuff all the time, trying to get better in uh, eliminating our weaknesses, et cetera, for that very reason, because you never know. And, and after you go through it a couple of times, that phone does ring and you realize you are going that the band that the band you have is the band you have. And if they, if they, they suck, <laughs> they, don't, they don't play well. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're showing up with you know where did um what where were you uh training in the world i mean you mentioned the you were you had a mission in the arctic but like where were you um training throughout the world well my first command was all northern europe and uh, central europe and that was eight years so that's that's where i ended up doing a lot of the arctic work um we also did lots of kayaking um a lot of underwater uh Combat swimming was called diving with oxygen rebreathers because our counterparts, the uh, the Germans and the French, were very very good at it, and they were training us. They had people in the United States helping us get better and better, and then we work with them in their countries. Uh, we had the British that were very very sharp in a lot of different areas, hostage rescue things like that. So we'd all we'd had strengths, they had strengths, and we'd work together. Um, the next team I went to was Central South America. So basically, that was the exact opposite. Instead of carrying 120 pound pack, you were you're hardly carrying anything, and you were instead of freezing, you were you were dying and and losing water water weight because you couldn't keep it going because you're sweating so much, and then you had the bugs <laughs> and the critters and all that kind of stuff. And 
weird kinds of swamp environments and um, 18 foot tidal changes and just a, a totally odd different environment. You know, it's not the tourist, the tourist Central America. It's not like Cancun. It's it's like being dropped in the middle of nowhere jungle and, and you can't move at night because the jungle is 100 percent around you. And if you and there might be a hundred foot cliff and you won't know it until you just go, ah, you know, so, you can't, <laughs> so it's a whole different kind of environment. Wow. Um, you ever um you ever come across any um yes like I mean to me like every animal can be a threat. Um so any animal any animals is that uh you know kill you. It, it's not so much the animals. There's these things that uh refer to as parachute ants that were in I think Panama and uh, what they do is they cling to the vertical vines. And they use them as a sensor system. And so if an animal or anything passes through, they release from the vine and they have membranes. So they float down and they land on the critter that caused it. And if you're walking through there and you've got the back of your collar with a little bit of gap, you, you get the, and then they sting really, really, really bad. So you can get a whole back full. All of it. First, you hit in the, the vine and then you start, and you don't see them because you're, they're so small, but uh, that was pretty bad. Uh, not an animal that's going to kill you or anything. Um, yeah. See, uh, vampire bats. Uh, you had to, you had to live up in hammocks because once it was dark, they would go off of your infrared heat, and they assume if they see that heat that that's an animal that's on the ground, and so they actually would land on the ground and crawl and then try to you know bite into a a small animal over to get the blood. So when uh, and we were taught this right, so we get we get in the hammocks, we're sitting there, and then you hear. And you realize, uh oh, and they're like, you know, like New York City rats, you know, they're and they're crawling around and, and you know they're down there. <laughs> so nobody, so nobody's going, nobody's taking a bathroom break all night because nobody wants to get out of the hammock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So weird stuff like that, you know, and, and you know, you grab a vine and it moves and it's a snake, not a vine. It just, that, that that's, kind of, that's terrifying, you know, or just you're in the ocean and suddenly sharks, you know, close to your face. I don't know how it works, um, but. <laughs> that, that's the kind of crazy. I mean, one shark, one shark, one time. And uh, it was, it was an odd, uh, I was doing a combat swimmer thing with a mini submarine and uh, the mini submarine came in and the two guys we had in the back, um, I took them into a, the end of a pier tip escorted them there and then they were going to go to the very base of the pier and put some fake explosives on a coast guard cutter there was supposed to be an enemy boat and my job was to wait at the end of the pier it was a these kind of like telephone pole type um piers and wait for them to come back and then escort them back down to the mini sub because we had a a um like a wire cable that we ran from the mini sub up to there and i tied it off so we could find our way back and there was a yellow light at the end of the pier. You could kind of see about maybe 10 feet out at night. And I'm just sitting there and uh, and they're getting there late. And they're, and they're about 10 minutes late, then they're 15 minutes late. It's not that big of a swim. And then I see them coming and they're coming down the end of the pier. And a, a diver who's swimming towards you that has a rebreather on, you see his head at the top like this. And then there's like a, a little belly. That's what the rebreather sits on your chest. So it looks like a kind of a broad teardrop and that's what was coming at me. And it was a 12 foot bull shark. And I didn't realize it until it was about four feet away from me. Cause I'm out there like waiting for him. And then I, I saw, then I started to see the fin and I saw its face and I went and I pulled myself and I went into the, into the pier and it just, you know, there's no, no there's no sound to this. Right. Yeah. And you just move like a spaceship just went, and just went off into the darkness. And then I'm thinking, uh Oh, the STB pilot, the mini submarine pilot's down there. He has no idea there's a bull shark. Mm -hmm. Then I thought, I got to get these guys back across, you know, 30 yards of, of this water where the shark just went to. And then uh, and then I wondered why they were late. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is all going through my head in about 12 seconds. And then one of these guys grabbed my shoulder and I pissed myself. They had been crawling through the center of the pilings of this pier. And the pier had these big cross beams and they were crawling over with all their gear on to avoid the shark because when they got to me they grabbed me they went push a fin on their head right and i went you know <laughs> so 
And then we went down to the bottom of the sand and we swam on our backs and I pulled on that cable and we were like looking 360 degrees. So we got to that mini submarine. <laughs> and I get in there and the pilot looks at me and he goes, what took you guys so long? He had the canopy open, his arms out like he's he's at the drive-in movie or something. And I said, you might want to close your canopy. And I told him. And then nobody believed us. That, you know, they thought we just made the whole thing up. But then the Coast Guard guys said that they'd been chumming the end of the pier for bigger fish. And then they, they knew that there was a shark that was roaming around out there. Of course, they told us that after I died. <laughs> so that was the closest underwater encounter I ever had with anything of, wow. of any danger. So. Oh, my gosh. Um, wow. Uh, like my worst nightmare. Well, it's a lot of nightmares of mine. Um, <laughs> one of them. So I want to ask you, because you mentioned, um, and I've never had someone on my podcast that's also been an instructor at Butts. And I want to ask you, um, I know that you... Jocko was one of the people that was that you were in the instructor, right? For one of his classes or something. Okay. So I want right. to know some questions. I have some questions about now you're in, now you're um, one of the trainers at Buds. Um, how is it for you like watching it and, and, and being the instructor versus, you know, you were, you were them, uh, X amount of years ago and were there well let's let's start there and then I have some other questions. Probably the most interesting takeaway was when you're going through it, you don't see what's going on behind the scenes. So it's it's kind of like that that hypothetical image we have that at Disney World, you know, as soon as you drop something and walk away, the plant opens, there's a trap door and some little hand comes out and grabs the trash and you know that there's this whole world there trying to make Disney World perfect you don't get that impression and you also get the impression that everything's chaos that they're just making up their mind to do something you know, hey we're going to the classroom we'll talk about this and another guy comes in you guys all stink you guys failed your inspection this morning we're going on a 12 mile beach run let's get out of here now move go and so it's not, it seems like it's random and that, of course that freaks a lot of people out and and all that psychology that that creates of you know i thought we were having a break in a classroom now all of a sudden i got a 12 mile run i learned um that that's all BS. I learned that everything is choreographed. Everything is scripted. Uh, Hell Week had a book this thick, and every single thing that was done in Hell Week was choreographed. It had equipment lists. It had time time checklists. It had quality standards. It had safety standards. It had medical oversight. And I had no idea it was like that. And they said, oh, yeah, it's always been like that. Like, <laughs> okay, you, know, you, you don't know. So you do an evolution where you go out and you do some kind of training and you don't even realize how many people are actually have eyes on you. You don't know that there's a medic staged around the corner. You don't know that there's an officer in charge, you know, 20, 30 yards away with a radio getting the feedback on how things are going. You have no idea this is all happening, you know, and it's kind of like a movie set. Uh, the very first event, my first day as an instructor was the 14 mile run, which is 14 miles, so seven miles down and seven miles back on soft sand with boots. And I walked in there and there was this big long board and it looked like a Candyland map. And I'm listening to this briefing. It sounded like we were going to go kill Bin Laden or something. It was just incredibly detailed mission briefing. And there were like 20 people involved in this. And there were water stops and there was medical stops and there was radio checks and there was different staging points and there was rally points. I mean, it was crazy. And yeah, well, that's how it's always been done. <laughs> really? um, so that was a big shock to me. And the other thing that I realized after about a month was that it's set up that way so that the outcome is consistent, like an experiment or like a, you know, like a recipe. Because if you let the instructor just randomly do whatever they want to do, what, or even do what you're, they're supposed to do, but do it longer than they're supposed to, you get all kinds of unintended effects. Um, for example, one time in Hell Week where I was the, um, I was the officer of, of this was after I came back later as an officer, um, of a different phase, the land warfare phase. And we we're getting ready to relieve a group that had been up all night. So they were there from 12 to four and I come in with my team and we're going to relieve them. And we just hand off the students and there's a log book. You're writing everything down every minute that happens. Anybody that quits, there's a, you have to write down everything, who counseled them, how many times they were counseled and all that. Like I said, it, it's very, very um, controlled. And the, the students were at the 
on a beach on the bay side of San Diego and they were in a big pile and they were sleeping. And so we came up there and said, all right, you know, what's going on? Well, we can't get them to wake up. So to cut to the chase, what I was able to figure out and eventually the rest of the people at Buds were able to figure out is that the group that was before us, the officer in charge wasn't from the first phase and didn't understand this idea about you can't change the recipe, you can't mess, mess things up. And they had pushed them too hard the night before. They did things that were very, very, very uh, difficult and very, very exhausting for three or four times longer than they should have. And the whole thing is, is set up so that you're just on the edge of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. If you take them down below that edge, they shut down. They're human beings. And, and then you can't do anything. Then, then they, get, they get to sleep because you can't wake them up. It took us about 15 minutes. We peeled every person. It was probably 25 bodies. We peeled every person off and had to wake them up individually and because they'd gone into a deep sleep. I mean, they were, they were deep, deep, deep. That we blew whistles. It didn't matter. <laughs> yelled, nobody moved. And it was because somebody had over, overdid it. They messed with the recipe. So that was an interesting thing to learn. And uh, and then the third thing, which I alluded to before, but you were talking about your eyes are smiling. Every every instructor in first phase of SEAL training can tell you in a in say about the middle of the second week who's going to quit and who's going to stay. That was one of my questions. I wanted to know. You could tell? Because you can see it in their face. You can see if there's a twinkle in their eyes or when you look at them, they look at you like they're the predator. <laughs> you go, okay. You know, but if you look at people and all you see is somebody who's already decided they're a victim of this and they're trying to figure out the best, most honorable way out, and it gets worse as time goes on, and it's more and more pronounced. You could actually, by the end of the second week, probably go up on a board. And we used to we used to put stuff up on the board, you know, we this I think who's who I think is gonna quit or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um you'd be like 95% correct. And then if you weren't hundred percent correct, the five percent that you were wrong, they they make you right by the second third hour of hell week so they quit then but you could tell you could you could see it you could see it in day one there was always at least 10 to 20 percent that were like I, i'm in the wrong place um the twinkle is the important part you, you're talking about smiling you know the uh back to being infectious an infectious kind of behavior um it's hard to feel like a victim if you're smiling it's hard to feel like it, it that the world's happening to you if you're smiling you know you're I'm here because I chose to be here and I'm doing what I'm doing because I wanted to do this and I'm going to tough it out because I decided that this is worth getting through. Mm -hmm. And so those are all positive choices. And it's the voice in your head saying, I'm here for a reason. I'm here to, you know, I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. And, um, and then the exact opposite facial expression on somebody who's already decided. No. Nah. Yeah. So you learn that it takes, it takes a little bit, of maybe by your second class, you came pretty good at it. By the third class, that you see you're you're an expert at it. Mm -hmm. By the time you've been two years as an instructor, which is the tour length, I mean you're almost like a psychologist. You can you can <laughs> look at body language. You can, you can tell quickly. You can tell the officers that are falling apart. You can it's just because you're just there. You're there as an observer. It's like you're a scientist watching this experiment day after day, after hour after hour, month after month. Could you um after doing that like now? in civilian life like assess people from like just like an everyday civilian yeah. from from all that absolutely yeah i think uh you know the lessons that can be taught you don't have to be a navy seal to learn how to manage stress you don't have to be a navy seal to learn about a positive mental outlook you don't have to be a navy seal to focus on others and focus on the group's purpose and not just your own single-minded you know set of objectives. Um, any human being can absorb those lessons, be taught those lessons. You have to teach people the value of it. I think you can um, you can do scenario-based training and business, so to speak, and, and do practice um, stress level engagement. You can say, okay, we just lost our number one supply chain uh, vendor completely. You've got an hour to figure out what we're going to do. And you walk out and they've got an hour and they if they've never done it before, they're they're freaking out for the first five minutes or 10 minutes. Then somebody tries to be the alpha person and take over. Oh, no, 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 what we're going to do. It doesn't mean they know what they're going to do uh, or they're the right person to lead. And everybody's looking at the clock. And usually about 
halfway through that hour, they've wasted all this time uh, coping in their own individual ways. And then they start to galvanize. Somebody says, look, guys, we have 30 minutes. And then they start working the problem. And you can do that in almost any kind of you know, human activity. You know, it could be an EMT team practicing, you know, something that happens if you that doesn't happen very often, like a catastrophic mass casualty drill or something. And what it does is it, it gets you to see the benefit of collaborating, working together, fusing together as a team, single-minded uh, focus, uh, brushing off the stress of either time constraints or resource constraints, uh, and sometimes environmental, um, external kind of pressures. You practice it, you practice it, you become better, you get to the mindset of it, it is what it is, now let's work the problem. So yeah, it absolutely is transferable. What um what can an individual like an individual do to um manage or manage stress? Like what what types of things could they create for themselves in stress or put themselves in a stress position and then get themselves to manage it? I'm a I've been a lifelong learner. I'm I'm always in about twelve books simultaneously. I I seek out advice and mentoring from other people. So I would do that. I would I would whatever the areas that you think the stress is going to be related to, whether it's professional, personal, you know, relationship issues, try to find somebody that's gone through it before. Mm -hmm. Kind of like we're having this dialogue here. What did you do to handle it? You know, um, we lost, we lost uh, um, our oldest son when he was 22, 17 years ago. Talk to people that had gone through that before. How did you deal with it? How did you cope with it? You know, that's one of those things where the voices in my head, I had no stress pre protection or practice in that, right? Yeah. Um, and then later on, I was able to, to help other people who had the same thing happen to them with, you know, some insight. And there's, so there's always somebody out there that's probably walked in the shoes you're about to walk in. And, and normally people are willing to help and give you some insights. And if you talk to five or six or seven people that have gone through something, Pretty much you get the common wisdom and it's pretty close on how do you survive, how do you cope, how do you get through the issue, how do you recover, or how do you prepare? And that that's just kind of a life learning kind of a thing. If you open yourself up to that, you become less vulnerable, less fragile. And then when the real thing happens, you're better prepared. Well, is there any lessons that you because you you went into buds at like 18, right? You were like, right, right young and <laughs> um what hmm. lessons did you like learn from there that carried carried you on and then and helped you in the civilian world that like something that us everyday civilians can also um you know use well there's a saying it's not about me it's about we and i and i saw in my time as an instructor more than than as a student when you put somebody in charge, they stop thinking about their own problems. When they start focusing on trying to get a group of people across the finish line or, you know, through a series of, of obstacles, et cetera, they focused on the people and they focused on the group and they focused on the outcomes. And I, and, you know, I thought maybe officers were just selected that way. No, they're not. They're just people that went to college. And we lost officers in, in, in buds as much as enlisted guys, but the officer attrition, the overall attrition, 75% going back to 1962. So 75% don't make it through the six months. Now five months because they've changed a little bit. Um, but the attrition for officers is about 25%. And I'm absolutely uh, convinced that it's not because they're better people than the enlisted guys. It's because they were put in charge of other people from day one, because we had officers quit when we had classes with too many officers to put them in charge of somebody and the people that quit were always the guys who didn't have anybody to be in charge of we also had enlisted guys and we had too few officers that we put in charge of groups because we didn't have the officers to do it and those guys suddenly were rock solid and you know it, i think so if you put yourself in charge if you think like a leader you you're going to affect things and you're going to be a positive force it helps you to you know the more you've done it, the more you realize it's, it's a positive to you too. And, and if you see somebody leading, helping them lead, what can I do to help? What can I do to get, get us all across this thing, through this thing, whatever? That's a form of leadership support, but that's also kind of leadership too. And, 
And then you can practice and watch what they're doing for the day when you become the leader. So those are things that I watched as a third party, you know, watching the class, not as a student, but I absolutely convinced that um, convey to, to, to everybody in life. And the thing I said before about find people that are optimistic, stay away from people that are pessimistic. I don't care what business you're in. I don't care if you're in government or you're, you're a nonprofit. Um, if you're in the, uh, the, the, com the community landscaping club, you know, stay away from negative people. Negative people will pull you into the negative realm and you will, you will just become that way. Mm -hmm. Find people that are upbeat. You know, you, you, you have a choice about who you associate yourself with most of the time. So those, those are the two biggest takeaways. I I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. And and thank you for, for being guests on my show. I really enjoyed talking with you. I think you're, you, you gave some great insight and uh, I really liked your stories. I could have kept, I could have gone on for hours just listening to your stories. They were, they were amazing. Thank you so much for sharing and being here. Thanks everyone who's listening. Please like, share, comment, subscribe now, become a Patreon member so you can get full access to our bonus episodes and extra goodies that only our Patreons get. And tune in next week for our next episode. Thank you so much for listening to our show.